Welcome everybody to uh, our reading group for The Life Divine by Sri Aurobindo. Uh, this is, my name is Marco Morelli, and uh, this event is um, being hosted by Metapsychosis Journal, the Readers Underground. Uh, this is our second session uh, together, uh, but it's the first one in which we'll be discussing the text of The Life Divine. And our aim is to read this entire book uh, over the next roughly six months, going into just about before the, before the holidays. But that's an open aim. We're going to try this uh, at the pace that we're going, which is roughly about 50 pages a week, and check in uh, at the end of each session as to whether that's comfortable for people or whether maybe comfortable isn't the point, but whether if, if, whether it's kind of just the right, the sweet spot for what we need in, in this particular group. Um, part, of the, uh, part of the idea here, uh, because it's such a large text and it's so, there's so much in it and we're covering a fair amount, is, uh, is partly to hew to the text and understand the ideas and review them, but part of it also is to generate kind of a, an intersubjective field where we're enacting something that is being transmitted through the text in our dialogue and in our, uh, in our interaction with each other. And so in, in order to invoke that kind of space or, or uh, create kind of the container that's more conducive, uh, we have a, a few guidelines just to as, suggest, as ways to kind of point our attention to uh, what we might be able to uh, experience here or, or create here together in this moment now uh, as, as you know, the humans who are, have just read a text together in our asynchronous and distributed ways, but then are converging into this, this, this moment to, to um, bring it forth in some way or bring forth ourselves in relation to it in some way. So the idea is that um, I'm going to just read them here. These were suggested to me by a friend uh, who had a lot of experience with these kinds of, these kinds of um, events. But the idea is that once we begin conversing, that we're going to draw attention, everyone's attention to the moments of shared silence rather than people instinctively filling or obscuring the silence, which amplifies group awareness of, quote, prior unity. So that's the idea that um, it's okay if, there's, we don't have, no, don't know exactly where to go next. It's okay if you don't know exactly what to say. We can let those moments of silence kind of ripen a little bit. Uh, two is encourage participants to follow the thread of the conversation, building on and deepening what was said before, rather than interjecting egoic non sequiturs. And to me, my interpretation of this is just to pay attention to what is in a common space or field and where the conversation wants to go through us. Uh, third is to ensure that everyone participates and doesn't hold back, self-contract. No matter how shy, uh, active, engaged listening uh, can count as a minimum baseline. Uh, and so, you know, with all of us here, we're, if we were to split up the time equally, we, we wouldn't all get that much time. So what we're mostly doing is really listening and through our listening, evoking where the conversation goes or uh, inviting the conversation to go deeper, to go into greater clarity on something. Uh, that all happens in the, in the shared field of our listening. So um, we'll, we, one other feature of these uh, get-togethers is that we're rotating leadership of the discussion, uh, meaning that each time somebody different will lead off the discussion. That doesn't mean that they need to uh, direct the whole discussion or um, manage it in any way. They, they, they can. Uh, they can invent how they want to approach it, but we're allowing kind of a, an openness, even an experimental um, uh, possibility. Uh, and so Matteo will do it how Matteo does it, and Duggins will, Doug will do it how he does, and I will how I do. And I'd like us just to pay attention to what we bring into the space as, our, as individuals. Uh, I think uh, based on the reading that we've done so far, that's an, as an important aspect, a very important aspect of, of Aurobindo's thought here. And um, 
Uh, last thing I'll say is that uh, I'm, uh, well, two things. One, I'm grateful for you all being here. Uh, two is that we have an interesting mix. And so this, no, this deal about not self-contracting, I think, is really important. We have scholars here, artists, scientists, poets, um, people who have been successful in business or have practiced business, people who are academics. There's a, there's a mix and so I'm very interested myself in what comes out of the admixture of, of different kinds of people uh, with diverse experiences, sharing a reading experience together, but then, you know, experiencing in their own and in our own particular weird ways. Uh, that's personally something that I'm interested in. And in addition, I'm interested in learning what Aurobindo uh, had to say and in uh, really exploring how that is of relevance to my life, to our shared reality, and to what's going on in the world right now. So that said, let's begin our meditation. And then, uh, and then uh, Matteo will lead us off with the conversation. And Matteo, would you also like to time us? Great. And so uh, one other note, uh, just... Uh, with the muting, you'll, you'll, I'll let, leave that to you to self unmute whenever you, you, you want to talk. And it's kind of awkward with the virtual space and everybody, you know, looking at little squares of, it's not uh, organic per, in person. So just listening for where the opening is um, and however it unfolds is, is okay. And it may be a little bit clumsy and uh, we'll just keep, we'll just keep, keep going with it. All right. Good, so we'll do five minutes and I will time it so that you don't. <clears throat>
Good. So as Marco suggested, let's have Flo, Eric, and Heather. And Lauren didn't introduce herself last week either. So maybe those, those four. Introduce yourself. Last week we said who we are, where we are, why we're interested in the text, whatever you care to share. I can introduce myself. My name is Eric Weiss. I've been um, studying Sri Aurobindo fairly intensively since the late 90s, um, mid, mid to late 90s. I taught courses on Sri Aurobindo at the um, California Institute for Integral Studies and at the Sophia Center of Holy Names College. And I now teach a class every week at the uh, Sri Aurobindo Learning Center here in Crestone, Colorado. I'll introduce myself next. My name is Heather, and I'm currently living in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, I'm interested in this text primarily because I haven't read an Aurobindo text in full, and I've had a few experiences. I worked at California Institute of Integral Studies for almost two years, and um, met Mateo, actually, at the um, ashram at Lodi. So I've been in the uh, interested in, but not able to devote time to this project so far. Thank you. I'm uh, Florian and uh, I'm uh, in, living in Berlin and um, I came here through Matteo as well, whom I met um, two years ago must be uh, here in Germany at the AVI conference where I was playing guitar and um, yeah I studied guitar I teach guitar classical um, guitar so I'm a musician and uh, yeah you find me who would find me quite often at the um, Aurobindo Center in Berlin here as well so um, yeah that's roughly yeah I'm very happy to be here with you Hi everybody. Um, I, uh, I I also am friends with Mateo and Eric. It's good to see you. It's been years. Mm -hmm. um, I took some of his classes at um, the California Institute of Integral Studies, and that's where I was introduced to Arobindo and um, just fell in love with his philosophy as it completely spoke to me and my. Um, experience of the world and uh we read most of the book in your class eric but i don't think we read the whole thing in entirety mm -hmm. so i'm really looking forward to reading it cover to cover and having another chance to discuss it with the group as well Great. So mantra is a big part of my practice and I'm no scholar. I appreciate scholarship, but I'm no scholar myself. And I have been in love with the opening epigram to this book for a long time. It's part of my practice. So I wanted to, in thinking how I would even start this off, I would like to start it off with chanting this mantra three times from a meditative state and see where that takes us. It seems like uh, it seems like that will be good with this group. We'll, we'll see. But I'm going to chant it three times and have meditative space before and after, and then start by uh, talking about why I love this this passage from Mandala One of the Rig Veda written by Kutsa Angirasa as a hymn to divine dawn. 
<clears throat> Pardon me if my voice cracks. I'm no singer, but I love to chant. Oh, I recommend also, if you'd like, to be on mute. It won't work well if we're not on mute, but if you are on mute, because it won't work well over VoIP, but if you are on mute and you have it open, uh, feel free to chant with me. Oh, before we start, John, would you, John introduced himself last time, but would you like to say something quick before I chant the first? And you're, you have a, John, you do have a lot of background noise. Yeah. Don't, don't let me interrupt. I was, I got the time incorrect this evening, so I'm late. So mm -hmm. I'll just tune in with it. You, you popped up just as we were transitioning, so I let you in. So. I'm sorry. What? You you popped up just as we were transitioning into the this chant that Mateo is going to lead off with. So okay, it was, please. It was please a, very good timing for being late. Please continue. Thank you. Could you meet John? Ah, oh, good. She follows to the goal of those that are passing on beyond. She is first in the eternal succession of dawns that are coming. Usha widens, bringing out that which lives, awakening someone who was dead. What is her scope when she harmonizes with the dawns that shone out before and those that now must shine? She desires the ancient mornings and fulfills their light, projecting forwards her illumination. She enters into communion with the rest that are to come. She follows to the goal of those that are passing on beyond. She is first in the eternal succession of dawns that are coming. Usha widens bringing out that which lives, awakening someone who was dead. What is her scope when she harmonizes with the dawns that shone out before and those that now must shine? She desires the ancient mornings and fulfills their light. Projecting forwards her illumination, she enters into communion with the rest that are to come. She follows to the goal of those that are passing on beyond. She is first in the eternal succession of dawns that are coming. Usha widens, bringing out that which lives, awakening someone who is dead. What is her scope when she harmonizes with the dawns that shone out before and those that now must shine? She desires the ancient mornings and fulfills their life. Projecting forwards her illumination, 
She enters into communion with the rest that are to come. I love those verses of the Rig Veda. They, uh, and I don't, I can't say why Sri Aurobindo started the life divine with those verses, but the chapter is the human aspiration. And he says over and over again that if you have a chance sometimes, I know that some of you know the author's note to Savitri. And in, in the author's note, that just right in the beginning after the table of contents of Savitri, Sri Aurobindo talks about the gods, talks about the characters of Savitri, and he does this in Secret of the Veda over and over again, talks about the gods not being mythological beings, but being beings that are correlates to the parts of our being and the planes of consciousness that we come in touch with, emanations. And as Usha, the opening epigram to the life divine, the eternal dawn, following to the goal of those that are passing on beyond, the individuals that are aspiring to the transcendent. She follows to the goal of those that are passing on beyond. She is first in the eternal succession of dawns that are coming. I love that rap, the first of the eternal succession of dawns that are coming, reaching back to the past and bringing it into the present and uh, launching us into the future. She desires the ancient mornings and fulfills their light, projecting forwards her illumination. She enters into communion with the rest that are to come. It's like nothing is left behind in the arc of evolution. And that's, a, that's what I'll share for now and open, open the field up for discussion. I, I would also like to recommend that the mute be the way in which we communicate to our, our uh, group here that we're done talking. And I just in line with what Marco read, maybe take a couple of breaths before the next person unmutes to, to say something. I want to make an observation about the repetition in the mantra because the fact that and the felt experience of, of you reciting it and repeating the same sequence of words over again so that we come back to the images and the ideas expressed in those words. It brings up a, for a question about where in the, in the, let's say, eternal cycle of things, this book arises. And in, to what extent is it a singular event? And this moment a singular event and and to what extent 
is it a, a repetition? An, an instance in an in eternal succession of dawns. That, that's where my, uh, that's kind of where my mind and paradox come into some, some uh, uh, interesting kind of <laughs> curiosity, I, 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 I'd say. So thank you for, for, for that. Uh, well, I'm a therapist, so maybe my mind just kind of works that way a little bit. But I found myself reflecting, as you were chanting, I, I was aware of my son quite strongly. And um, a little bit of anxiety today around, you know, my being the best dad I can be and how's he going to be um, growing up, but also just very aware of him um, and my love of him. That's what came up for me. So thank you. I might uh, respond to that question about the repetition. <laughs> In one sense, it's clear that this text is a repetition and that it's saying what was said in the Vedas and what was said in the Bhagavad Gita and, and many other texts. But on the other hand, there's a sense that Sri Aurobindo may be doing something novel, something new, when he talks about the idea of fully incarnating the divine in the material world. So Aurobindo has a vision of evolution in which the goal, the next goal, is the formation not only of a new species, but of a new kingdom of nature in which the divine will be fully incarnated in human bodies. And so it's possible that, that in saying that, he is saying something new. I'm not sure, but I, but I think so. I would like to pick that up and <clears throat> add something. If I recall it right, he does that very often in uh, other writings, at least, that he um, gives a summary first and then comes back to what he, what he stated and he just um, elaborates the thought and makes the circle back. So that would just fit into that picture, I guess. The idea that matter, all of co the cosmos, would become divinized, infused with absolute consciousness, uh, remind, reminds me of uh, the singularity idea, the technological singularity idea, some of the ideas of, of Ray Kurzweil, uh, for example, uh, who believes that the you know exponential accelerating process of technological informational biotechnology etc uh, will ultimately result in an intelligence so powerful so profound that it can in effect colonize the in, the entirety of this earth then the solar system and the galaxy, and then and then the universe. It, it has that same tel telos, that same teleological uh, endpoint. And I, I'm I'm curious about the correlation or the influences between this uh, integral uh, um, 
view of a, a total union of the material and spiritual aspects of, of reality with the techno utopian uh, view that we're on this trajectory towards a, um, a fusion, uh, a, a, a kind of infinite, infinity point, you know, beyond which we have no idea what happens, but there's some kind of absolute um, culmination uh, of cosmological evolution. Sorry, I got so nervous speaking that I uh, actually missed half of my uh, thought. <laughs> so I want to add that what I just said, he also does it here because this picture of the sun coming back to its, you know, always coming back to its um, first state is exactly uh, what he what he says uh, is one of his first thoughts in the book that uh, spirit is involved in matter. And so it's already there, it's just unfolding. So I think um, that's like a, yeah, wh where I wanted to go with my, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I found this text, um, I don't know quite how to say it, but I found the text infinitely more beautiful than I expected. Uh, there's a, a deep poetic sense in the writing. And I picked out a, a passage that spoke to me, and it's interesting because, anyway, I'll read it, and then we can, uh, I can talk about it. So it's in Chapter 3. He says, it has been argued in reply that the material universe enjoys an eternal self-existence. It was here before life and mind made their appearance. It will survive after they have disappeared and no longer trouble with their transient strivings and limited thoughts. The eternal and inconscient rhythm of the sun's. And so it's the sunrise, but but viewed in a different way, right? So he's talking about suns and he's talking about the larger cosmos and it's this return of the sun, but in a very different perspective. So it's one of the images that really, really struck for me when when I was reading this. Jeffrey, that only just reminded me of this really short work that Sri Aurobindo has. And if I get the title wrong, I can find it. It's like called The Seven Supermental Suns and links all these in with our chakras through the from the finite base, the free base, all the way to the infinite. It's a really beautiful short work. Maybe I'll try to find it and link you all to it. One of the interesting things about the text is that Orvindo will often lavish a lot of creativity on um, articulating positions he wants to contradict. And that's uh, the case with this passage that Jeffrey read, that uh, here he's saying it has been argued that the physical world is everything and that it will it pre-exists and will continue to exist after the, after the domain of life and mind. But he's going to contradict that right afterward. Thanks for bringing that up, Eric. There's actually a, a book called Greater Psychology, where there was a the person who wrote the foreword to that book had made a mistake academically in quoting Sri Aurobindo as an anti-Semite, but he had done just that in the human cycle where he talked about Germany in the opening statement say, saying that uh, false subjectivism looks like this and then describes the entire world in Germany pre-World War II. And if any of that's taken out of context, it says one thing 
without that opening statement. And he does this even over larger arcs. This is one reason why Life Divine gets a little difficult. There are some arcs later on where he, where we have to like be really uh, vigilant because he'll, he'll carry that arc for pages. He'll carry the arc for five, 10 pages. And for me, it's easy to lose track of. It's harder to, it's harder to maintain the thread than it is easy to lose track of where we are with it. Maybe we can help each other on those lines. I have read Paul Tillich recently, a couple of years ago, and there's quite a few similarities in what you're saying, Eric and Matteo, and maybe Jeffrey noticed too, but Paul Tillich would also go on for pages of kind of going with against Christianity and then going into how it supports Christianity or going the opposite way how. Um, but anyways, um, I'm seeing a lot of similarities there. And one of Tillich's ideas is the ultimate concern as well, which um, I had read most of the Life Divine about 10 years ago and picking up on Tillich two years ago, I, I realized why now that I'm rereading the Life Divine, why there's so many connections because they both come from that, that same time period, the same um, maybe urgency that might have been felt in a certain sense. So um, just quickly in a kind of response in a way, but I had made a note while I was reading this that there are several writers, like uh, Doug, you mentioned Tillich, but Sloterdijk does this a little bit too. He starts an argument and then, and he goes on for several pages and then you realize he's actually arguing the opposite. And I was thinking about that, that there are different writers. Obviously, Aurobindo was writing earlier than these other writers. So maybe in a way, he was one of the first, I don't know, doing this kind of thing. But I'm wondering if that isn't, because it's a kind of a writing where you're aware of the paradoxes when you're writing. It's like you're arguing one side, but you're writing in such a way that your argument reflects the opposite side in the paradox as you're writing. And I'm wondering if that isn't a kind of current in emerging in, in, in the culture where people are beginning to write a bit more in a way that is conscious of the paradoxes and not just presenting one argument independent of the paradoxes that sit behind it. So, I mean, certainly one sees this throughout Aurobindo's writing, but I think it may be a wider phenomenon in the culture and not just Aurobindo. Anyway, it was a reflection that I had while I was reading it. I suspect that's a very old current because Plato did it quite a bit. So it's, 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 it's sort of fairly standard in philosophical texts to present the argument that you want to contradict. Although I yeah. wouldn't say myself that he contradicts. What's beautiful, I think, about this text and what where it might be distinct, where I think it transcends irony, is that he affirms he affirms the materialist position. He affirms the idealist or the spiritualist or the ascetic uh, position, but then he wants to include them in a wider affirmation. And to me, what's, what's really beautiful is the, the clarity, I think, and the, the breadth, breadth of that affirmation. Yeah, and in some ways I find it almost hard to follow. I, I have to like reread sometimes just to confirm what it is that I'm I'm reading from him. Um, 
but it also reminds me a lot of my own writing and my thesis I did at UC Santa Cruz, where I was also really like putting out the arguments that are contradictory and trying to yet include them in a greater whole, like you were saying. Um, I think I agree completely with Arobindo and this, like that our evolution is to like transcend our current reality and include it and in all that came before. On a logistical note, did you all get the outline that I sent by Dave Hutchinson? I haven't gotten through the learning curve of figuring out the the uh, web forum, so I think Marco reposted it somewhere. But it's a really helpful outline to follow to follow the arguments as as you're reading. Okay. <clears throat> um, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, as you were uh, reciting those verses, and I'm unfamiliar with them, I felt a, a resonance. Um, something about something about she is going to return, or she has returned before, or something like that. There's some echo, um, and um, I have a I had a very last night a, a dream sequence. It was basically just a, feel, a strong feeling tone, and it had to do with my mother and my relationship, and um, a, a sort of reflection upon the failures that both of us um, were involved in, and and I felt a, a a lot of regret, and I could feel her presence right behind me, and she was a very large. Uh, a very large energetic presence behind me. And right, almost like a little veil or a shimmering kind of veil or a sort of membrane. Um, on the other side of that, there was just an enormous serenity. And, um, you know, a total it, acceptance is, is probably the wrong word, but just, it was just very serene. And as I, and I just noted it, uh, but as I um, reflect on it now, as I was listening to your chant, I uh, I recall a scene in the the Mahabharata. Do does anyone know the Peter Brook film of the Mahabharata? I th I think it's I don't know if it has anything anything to do with the the Gita or the Upanishads. Uh, but it's a sacred text. I know that, and it's a dramatization by Peter Brook. But there's a wonderful scene. Um, a warrior, a very fierce warrior, on on the eve of a, a very big battle, and he's um, very tormented, and he has a vision of his mother, and um, he um, accuses her of abandoning him when he was a baby, and, and uh, that's a wound that he's never gotten over. And uh, there's a beautiful dialogue between the mother and the son. And the mother says to him, finally, she says, you know, I gave birth to you. I loved you. I awful, I've always loved you. And I wronged you. She, she, she doesn't defend herself, but she just says, forgive me, my son. I was so young. <laughs> you know? And I think that is so, uh, she's, she's very majestic, but at the same time, she's incredibly human um, because her failures were none of the, her failures came out of her, her own youthfulness and her own immaturity. But I just sensed that in this subtle experience, uh, as I recall that as I was listening to that chant, I think there's, this isn't the first time a mother and son have had problems, you know? So whatever I regrets I have about my mother and her behavior towards me or my behavior towards her, I feel like there is a, an aspect of that that's just, you know, human and unavoidable and extremely messy. And then there's also that serenity. So um, that's what's coming up for me now. And it's sort of one of my expectations actually for reading this book was that some of those schisms, um, I could get some, you know, I could, I could feel this transmission from this text so that some of this could have not just an intellectual excitement of reading something, you know, really well said, but 
of uh, resonating with these sort of like archetypal patterns, because that's how I sense it now, that this is something that I can, uh, I can hold it in a way that isn't um, going to re-traumatize me or anyone else. <clears throat> so thank you for le letting me uh, articulate this in public. Thanks. That was beautiful, John. I always think, how can we, for me, this is not a work of philosophy. It's a work of uh, uh, aspirational practice. And I always love asking, how can we use something like this? I feel like it's bathing in consciousness and it's filled with process and guideposts on the way. And thank you, John. Beautiful share. I, I back to the text, I really appreciated the, the materialist denial and the refusal of the ascetic. I love how the materialist den, the, the materialist denial is actually an argument to the ascetic of why to accept materialism, and the refusal of the ascetic is an argument to the materialists of why not to, why why to accept the world of the transcendent. It's it's like there's uh, waves running through this that are al almost exact reflections of its opposite and then emerging into the reality omnipresent and situating our own uh, in Sri Aurobindo never lets go of the individual. The work of the individual is extremely important. He says in the first chapter, something unless a revolutionary individual effort is made or if nature is able to speed up, this isn't, he's, I'm paraphrasing, but he says this isn't going to happen unless one of those two things clicks. And uh, he, he, it's like he's always toggling between, the, between soul, nature, and God. That triad is almost uh, running through all of this and is uh, something that I'm uh, aspiring to hold as I have another pass through this, through this amazing work. Uh, just about the t at the top of the hour, I think maybe we could take a moment to let in uh, somebody who's been waiting for the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, it's uh, so the person's name is Sherry Paul Pula. I don't I don't know them. Uh, they may have been here last week. Uh, so I'll let them in and perhaps in they could introduce themselves and uh, we could go into a second round of uh, of this kind of discussion or whatever you would like to do, uh, Matteo. Does that sound okay? Okay. Hello, Sherry. Terry. Terry. Terry O'Fallon? Yes. Hi. How are you? All right. Glad you could join us. I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> I thought I'd sit here until it was over and hoping somebody might see me. <laughs> I saw you. And uh, when we got to the, this moment, kind of top of the hour, I thought, well, let's let, let you in. But I didn't know it was you. I thought it was somebody named Sherry. Unless uh, that's what you call yourself. No, no. I've, I've got somebody else's name that keeps popping up on You just muted out, Terry. That's the wrong thing here. Terry, we've all introduced ourselves at one point, and this is our first meeting after the introductory meeting we had last week. Would you like to say a little something about yourself, and and then we'll open it back up for discussion? 
Um, um, I've been an educator for 55 years, and I, um, I'm working with adult development, well, with life development, the developmental models. Well, that's my passion right now. And especially how development fits with Aurobindo's work. That's one of my areas of study. So that's why I was interested in this group. Well, just to catch you up um, on what we've done, we began with a, a meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, I made some just a couple introductory remarks. Uh, we meditated, and then Matteo uh, led off the conversation with a, a, a chant, the chant from the beginning of the life divine. And that led into a, um, a, a period of reflections uh, on the chant and on the text. And the way that we're doing that is that um, we are keeping ourselves on mute until we're ready to say something. Until okay, and then remuting ourselves when we're when we're finished. So okay, uh, if you use the gallery view on Zoom, there's a button for it on the upper right. You'll be able to see everybody and their state of mutedness or unmutedness. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if, Matteo, you would, could you lead a second chant for the second hour? I'd love to hear another one if you have one. Sure. It would be the second chant. It sure. would be the second <laughs> epigram. Another. Um, Vamadeva, Gautama Vamadeva, wrote the entire fourth mandala of the Rig Veda, and he was referred to as the bard of the the bard of the Veda, his mandala four is so gorgeous. <clears throat> I'll chant it twice. Threefold are those supreme births of this divine force that is in the world. They are true, they are desirable. He moves there wide overt within the infinite and shines pure, luminous, and fulfilling. That which is immortal in mortals and possessed of the truth is a God and established inwardly as an energy working out in our divine powers. Become high uplifted, O strength, pierce all veils, manifest in us the things of the Godhead. Threefold are those supreme births of this divine force that is in the world. They are true. They are desirable. He moves there wide overt within the infinite and shines pure, luminous, and fulfilling. That which is immortal in mortals and possessed of the truth is a God and established inwardly as an in energy working out in our divine powers. Become high uplifted, O strength, 
pierce all veils, manifest in us the things of the Godhead. That was beautiful, Matteo. Um, it one of the things that it reminds me of is so I have this idea. Anyway, it's it's kind of without going into a long story about it. I'm writing a big novel, and it's got a lot of um, uh, religious themes or spiritual themes in it. And one of the it's science fiction. It takes place in the future. And one of the things I was struggling with was in a distant future, what would an integral religion look like? And so one of the things that, one of the mechanisms I came up for that was the idea that from God's perspective, everything is integrated. It is from human's perspective that things get divided up. But from God's perspective, all those different efforts are the same, pointing to the same thing. So I get a sense from that reading Aurobindo. It's like when he talks about the Brahman, and I, I recognize that this is related to earlier writings by other people about the Brahman, but so I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's unique to Aurobindo, but I do get this sense that he views the Brahman and this as a kind of let's look back at humans from that point of view rather than let's be human and look forward. And I get that sense from reading it. And I think it's an, a kind of an interesting perspective. So, and this, and this uh, chant brought me to that same place uh, in, in hearing it again. So. I think it's remarkable that Aurobindo brings in all these different perspectives, looking back at humans from Brahman and looking forward. It occurred to me that um, there are two mythic structures that Aurobindo characterized the work here. And one of them is a non-dual perspective in that Brahman is everything. Matter is Brahman, mind is Brahman, life is Brahman, and humans are Brahman. So it's all Brahman, and it's this non-dual kind of realization that shines through, that Brahman is everywhere. But then on the other hand, there's a structure that I would call Gnostic that relates back to the uh, ancient Gnostic teachings in which they would say that, um, like, every human is actually a star, is actually an immortal in some way and has descended into matter and has descended into the material world and is caught up in the confusion of the material world and has to go through this unveiling or this ascent to get back to the knowledge of Brahman. And and I, I keep feeling both of those stories kind of fusing in a, in a very complex way in this work. might be a moment to reconstruct the architecture of Aurobindo's arguments so far, because in the first five chapters, we go from the human aspiration to his uh, recapitulation of these two extreme perspectives on reality, the materialist, the idealist. Then we go to this Brahmanic idea, this Vedantic idea that Brahman is everything. Brahman is the reality, the sole reality, uh, manifesting in a multiplicity. And I think that's a, a, 
a bomb of a chapter. I mean, it's fantastic. But then the next, the next chapter is the individual. And it's almost only limbs, I think, the, the depth of what could be said and what he might, may say. And I have not read the full book before in this lifetime anyway. Um, but I, there's that, I think, uh, I don't want to call it a paradox exactly, but it's the pivotal, he uses the word pivotal importance of the individual. And at the same time, it's not about the egoic individual. So I'm curious about how pract- practically, really, the individual, I'm an individual, right? We, we all are individuals. How we uh, would become those and I'm not trying to be too aspirational here. I still have a little skepticism about this. Uh, but how we would become those ma- manifestors or those expressions, if assuming uh, this is uh, assuming we're not already, because that I think is true as well, um, of the divine, that Brahman, Brahmanic being, consciousness, bliss. And that's uh, <laughs> that may be a ridiculous question, just left hanging that way, um, because of course that is kind of the question in a certain sense, right? Um, so, so I, I don't want to. Um, well, it, it, it's the question, but it's also one that has to be renewed, perhaps, and that's important to renew and re-energize. Uh, and I'm glad that this philosophy provides some way of thinking about it. It might be worth mentioning that the the answer to that question is another book, The Synthesis of Yoga. And uh, so he, you know, for one thing, Aurobindo carries on this idea of the individual. And and it's really helpful, I think, intellectually and psychologically because we feel like individuals. And then the Buddhists say, well, there is no ego. And that's very confusing because there's a tendency to identify the ego with the individual. And what Aurobindo is saying is that the divine individual can be manifesting as an ego or not manifesting as an ego, but in either case is still a divine individual, still a fragment of the divine. So that, that, that's really helpful to me in thinking things through. And then in, uh, in Synthesis of Yoga, Aurobindo goes very elaborately through hundreds and hundreds of pages about how we overcome the ego. And he talks about the soul within us as manifesting in the the true, the good, and the beautiful, and how the different yogas involve the cultivation of the true, the good, and the beautiful to the point at which the divine can emerge, the, the hidden divine within us can emerge and, as it were, take over. But that's that's a huge discussion, as you point out. Can I can I respond? Um, I don't. Um, I haven't read this before, uh, but I just skimming through it. I just noticed there's a chapter on the Gnostic being. And you mentioned earlier the the Gnostic voices. Um, But I'm just sort of uh, thinking of that quote by, uh, I think it's St. Thomas. He says, if you bring forth that which is within you, it will save you if you don't bring forth that which is within you it will destroy you um so i feel very close to those uh those gnostic voices um and and that theme of um regression in service of the transcendent so as i was uh thinking about that uh subtle experience with my my mother and the sort of uh, moving from a, 
a sort of primary emotional response to something which is more uh, sort of like, you know, you have primary emotions and then there's something affective zone where they're reflected upon. Um, so I think that uh, that, that chapter on um, the refusal of the ascetic and the refusal of the materialist, uh, that yo-yoing back and forth, um, which I, I'm sure most of us are pretty familiar with, we can expand and then we can contract and we go back and forth and it can be very disorienting until you sort of let go of either. Uh, and you just can be with the contraction and you can be with the expansion and, and uh, not try to amplify the, uh, or hold on to any particular state. So I feel that this um, uh, could be kind of an approach for me, maybe sort of like a, like a training uh, for, for um, uh, that sort of regressive, being able to regress in a healthy way in order to transcend rather than just ascending. When that ascent becomes rejection, that's a problem. Uh, just as uh, maintaining a materialist stance and refusing any ascent can be a problem. So those are the things that are coming up for me right now as I, I listen to you guys and as I sort of resonate with the chants, because I think there's something in those chants, which is, um, uh, maybe it's sort of the, the musical quality. Um, but I'm just remembering, I think it was Wordsworth who says that uh, poetry is emotion uh, reflected upon in tranquility. So I can, I can sort of hear in those chants uh, a serenity and also there's something, there's some turbulence in there too. So there's, a, there's being able, this, uh, this serenity and this turbulence sort of, is held together with the voice. Um, so it's very, it's very soothing, but it also brings up stuff at the same time. So that's my response to it. So thank you. The second to the last chapter, the Gnostic Bean, answers your question in detail, Marco. It's beautiful that John pulled that out and linked it. Um, in, in the spirit of our uh, opening intention, I just want to ask, is there anyone that hasn't shared that uh, is open to commenting on any? The, Sri Aurobindo brings up so many points in these first chapters, the idea of disharmony being the, the evolutionary spur. He brings up speciation. He brings up the subtle organs and, and evolving organs to be able to, as our, as our uh, ability to detect consciousness widens, uh, evolving organs. There's just, uh, there's so much in these first five chapters. Any, anyone who hasn't shared want to share? Or anyone, only a suggestion with no no pressure to share at all. Well, I'll go ahead because I haven't shared yet. Um, I can't remember which chapter it was, if it was chapter three or chapter four. Um, but one of the things he was talking about was silence and the power of silence and being able to pick up on things that are in between. And... Um, you know, I kind of want to echo what Jeffrey said. I find the language very beautiful and I like the descriptions of things. And um, silence for me is very important. Um, I crave it. Um, and I don't mean like completely no sound whatsoever, but just being able to hear, my own, hear myself breathe and hear the birds and hear the wind. And so reading, you know, having him speak about that silence um, was really touching for me. And he was talking about it in such a way that... Um, what I thought about when he was talking about it was, I guess he was talking about a lot of um, different voices and different sounds, you know, and being able to discern through that and hear the silence. And what I was thinking of was how, like, if you combine all of the colors together, you actually get white. 
So I was starting to wonder, like, if you actually combined all the noises and all of the voices and all of the, um, you know, all of the sounds that are around us all the time, if you actually did collapse them down into one space, would it actually create silence? Kind of the way that all the colors, if you collapse them down, create white. So I just thought that was kind of a beautiful thing to meditate on. Um, and I was doing that quite often when we were doing your chanting. I was listening in between the notes and the resonances, but I was also listening to the birds outside and the wind and everything. So it was very beautiful. Thank you, Mateo. I think he says that silence with a capital S is the highest reach of mental consciousness and i know we're going to get there i know it's in the future a lot of the writing that he does he wants us to differentiate between physical consciousness vital consciousness and mental consciousness and uh, i think eric will can talk at length about synthesis of yoga and the admixture of these three consciousness consciousnesses uh, being an evolutionary spur and also being a uh, big part of human distortion, and uh, how we're misperceiving things. In these first chapters, I would uh, say he brings up a lot about kind of confusing and trying to set straight the difference between the logic of the finite and the logic of the infinite. He's not saying it directly in these first five chapters, but it's coming up as he's toggling us back and forth. Thank you for bringing up silence. There's a relationship, I believe, between that silence and one aspect or one, well, one aspect of re reality, the Brahmanic reality that I think he clarifies in these pages. And that's in, that's in that, uh, I, that idea that, or not just idea, that experience that beyond all phenomenal forms, there is a vast N nothing there's a vast sort of uh this is where the ascetic path leads is to uh cessation uh to a um a non-being uh, and i think that the, perhaps there are a couple of different expressions of that like there's the nihil of nihilism where the nothing is seen as pure uh, deadness in a, in a sense uh, he doesn't use that word but there's the nihil that is the the freedom aspect this is this is how he characterizes it that that cannot be constrained or refuses to be constrained by any form any particular idea any however subtle however abstract there's the, always an excess of more than and that the nihil and even perhaps the silence that allows access to that uh, freedom dimension uh, is uh, is not to be. Uh, it's a mistake, I guess. You know, it's a it's a ignorant perception to see it as deadness, to see it as separate from the active Brahman, the expressive Brahman that manifests as the forms, the noises, the birds, the train behind me, uh, and you know this all the technology stuff that's going on here. Um, so I, I found that helpful, uh, actually. And part of something I've reflected on, been reflecting on quite a bit, Doug has also mentioned this theory of nothing. And is there a, a affirmative a sort of... I wrote a book of poems once called The Joy of Nihilism. <laughs> and I was trying to get at that idea that nothing can be positive. Nothing is, it, it can't be reduced to anything, any idea, even if any totality, nothing. <laughs> that's, that's what's beautiful about it. Uh, and it actually is generative if you allow it to be. But once you turn it into a thing, obviously it ceases to be what it is, and not just logically, but even in our 
our um trans our, our let's say con conduct con conduct of it there's the train so thank you uh wendy for uh, bringing attention to, to that and to the theory of nothing uh, that we may be developing. Marco, I just couldn't help chuckling with the train, thinking of a train conductor, as you said, the word <laughs> conducting. <laughs> That's all I was saying. Everyone, <laughs> that was my hand gesture. Of course, I don't think trains today have any pull levers on them. It'd probably be something like this. It's not quite as interesting to talk to, them, to do that. Um, I, um I didn't finish the first five chapters, um, but I had a lot of great naps reading this. <laughs> um, and I mean that like in a good way, because like I was like, whoa, like, okay, I get this. It was just sort of like sinking in. And um, so I really enjoyed um, particular aspects. Um, I, I like this. Um, uh, this line about the material, um, it's sort of like life comes to fix on the immaterial and flee from itself in a disgust or a self-forgetting ecstasy. And it goes on, but I just like the way he writes and he kind of touches something sort of in the way that I, when you're know, trying to integrate this sort of non-dual sort of these experiences and reconciling that with the day-to-day and sort of um, the first chapter being sort of like on the aspiration and sort of like that sort of like that drawing to sort of like keep trying to make, not necessarily understand, but sort of sense into that, you know, nothing or to open into the subtlety of all these sort of invitations that we have moment to moment. And um, I just really think this is going to be a phenomenal experience to um, really familiarize myself with his work. So um just really appreciate it. But I'm just sort of like, whoa, this is hitting me like in my toes and my fingertips and everywhere in between. So it's sort of like, uh, I'm just sort of quiet. I don't know what to say, which is probably a good thing for me. <laughs> I I totally agree with you. Is it Kim? Um, so when I was reading this, I uh, had to break off every two, three pages and go away for a while and have a nap. Or So I wasn't even sure I was going to make it because early this afternoon, I was still had three chapters to go and I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to make it. But they went faster at that point. So I actually... Did, did did do all right with it but uh, but i i'm like you i like the the language speaks to me about these um, subtleties i guess of the the dialogue so i had a second quote that i picked out but it's related to what you were saying so the other quote was in the psychology of the east it, it has always been recognized as a reality and the aim of our subjective process the essence of the passage over to this goal is the exceeding of the limits imposed on us by the ego sense, and at least a partaking, at most an identification with the self-knowledge which broods secret in all life and in all that seems to us inanimate. Uh, that line inhabits me. You know, it, again, it's just a single line in the whole thing, and it's only a partial thought in the larger thought, but I find it's those echoes that that remain with me from the text, as well as the larger feeling. But I I, I focus in on those particular resonances, and it's like you say, they're 
how do we integrate these into our daily lives? So. It's half past the hour, and I know we can stay on longer, but I also know that the scheduled time is from uh, what, five, uh, six Eastern to seven, uh, six Mountain to six thirty Mountain time. So I think uh, it might be good to pause to let anyone off that needs to bid farewell. And I don't need to bid farewell. Uh, I can stay on for another half hour, but I just thought I'd open the space up in case anyone needs to say goodbye at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm still recovering from my health crisis and I think we'll uh, hang up this time. Beautiful to see you, Eric. Yeah. Let's chat soon, yeah. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, good night. Good night. Yeah, I think this might be a good place for me as well to finish for for this session. So thank you very much. And um, just really briefly, um, Marco, your point about uh, Kurzweil, just briefly on the technology side, I feel more encouraged uh, today than ever that uh, an alternative to Facebook is possible. So um, here's to that uh, technological evolution. And with that... <laughs> Derwin, can I ask a quick question before you go? Yeah. This is Heather. Hi, Heather. Hi. Did you paint the paintings in the Integral Center? Or is that what's on the wall behind That's you? That's Bryce Widem from... Uh, okay. Yeah, from... He's Colorado, so... Yeah, I definitely have a Colorado connection, and... Uh, so, yeah, that's his. <laughs> Great. You don't want my painting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for answering that. You bet. Thanks, Irwin. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Irwin. Bye. It's a good time for us to get going yeah. to um, this. has been a great meeting, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. To great to see you, Lauren. Bye, Oro. Bye. Say bye. Bye. Bye, Oro. <laughs> bye. 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 What's your name? What's your name? Owl. Yeah. Owl. <laughs> Owl. I can't get it to go away. There we go. Bye. I was really curious, Mateo, when you were talking about the subtle organs. Um, what is that? <laughs> Oh, he refers to them in Sanskrit. There's one uh, note in the in Human Aspiration where he talks about developing these subtle organs or developing other organs. I don't have the passage marked. Um, it's not just jumping off the page. But then in a further chapter, I can find it a lot quicker because there is a footnote with the Sanskrit Okay, okay here, yeah, the, the refusal of the ascetic. So, uh, page 21, well, uh, 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 chapter 3, uh, the second page of chapter 3. Sukshma indirya, subtle organs existing in the subtle body, sukshma deha. And then he also makes reference to these in the next chapter, too. He doesn't mention them by Sanskrit name, but he talks about development of the subtle organs in um, uh, uh, either, sorry, in either reality or omnipresent. Oh, no, no. Yeah, on rea um, the second page of reality omnipresent, uh, paragraph two, um, he, matter reveals itself to the realizing thought and to the subtilized senses. Oh my goodness, Kim and everyone like uh, getting into Sri Aurobindo's cosmology. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly vast. The details that he has left us with uh, 
parts of being and the planes of consciousness. Um, I'm barely into it and, and I've been working with it for 15 years. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty vast, but there's all these little tiny, there's all these little tiny bits along the way. And I think in these first five chapters, there's probably about three or four mentions of the subtleized organs. And there he does name them by name them by name. There's also, I can send out a reference. There's a, um, there's a book that's available online, the Sanskrit anyway, Glossary of Terms in Sri Aurobindo's Writing. And there's a Sanskrit section that uh, exists on a web page called uh, Oroma. No, no, no. I'm sorry. That's a different web page. Exists on a web page called Mirora. Mirora, probably mirora.org, mirora.com. You can email me or so if I forget to post it wherever, I can maybe just email it to Marco. And then it has a, a glossary of terms of all these defined Sanskrit terms, which is really useful reading through this to be able to specifically not not thumb through a Sanskrit to English dictionary, but find Sri Sri Aurobindo's definitions of the Sanskrit that he uses in his own words. I would like to ask a twofold question um, having to do with human development and Aurobindo's, again, just initiate just the beginning of a conversation about this in these, in these few chapters, but again, the individual, the individual development as being a progressive unfolding of the inner divine, the inner energy, right. Uh, expressing itself. Uh, and then the aspect of that, that's social. Here we are in a social context and pra- in a way practicing uh, a trans individual kind of development. And I wonder if, if there are any, uh, how, how that might be opened up in this text, uh, if, it's, if it's there or if it's maybe just latent at this point where we might tease out the, 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 um, you know, the threads of that, of how that thought unfolds. And I guess the other fold of it is, I, I know we have Terry uh, with us here who has deeply studied human development from a comparative uh, perspective amongst other perspectives. So Aurobindo has a model of that, one model. Uh, other thinkers, theorists, researchers also have theirs. And so that opens the possibility to, to compare, contrast, correlate, to see where um, you know, one model kind of leaves off or obscures something and another one picks it up. And so I wonder, my sense, my kind of just sense of it now, again, as not a scholar of Aurobindo, not even have, none having read this book, is that there's that focus on the individual is coming maybe more out of the modern sensibility and that in as we moved as we've moved in intellectual history into postmodern and uh, the more critical kind of uh, movements in in philosophy there's been a bit of a deconstruction of that and a focus or refocusing on the intersubjective aspects of of our experienced individuality so I wonder how those might begin to um, I may, may begin to kind of talk about the, those interfaces between the first person, second, third person, these, these, mul- these different modalities of perspective. Well, I'm here really a little bit more to learn than I am to, to, you know, say that I know much about this because the more I study it, the less I know, of course. Um, the work that I've done in conjunction with checking to see how it fits with R. Bindo's work, which has been a great guide for me, and I haven't even begun to touch the surface of what he works with. But to me, intersubjectivity is not 
individual. In it's reciprocity, and reciprocity is with other people or with a context, so that's a collective notion. And we have these repeating patterns um, that go from uh, concrete spaces with concrete objects to subtle, which come with the inner subjectivity, and then uh, up to uh, higher mind. These are each upshifts with each other, and the higher mind is is uh, the developmental level that we score at 6.0, the sixth person perspective. And as a collective frame for a kind of a beginning ocean and waves sort of process. So the way that I've used Aurobindo, uh, and I know I don't understand him perfectly, is to to do the research, develop the descriptions from the hundreds of people that have taken the inventories, and then I go back to Aurobindo's work and and look at his stages and see where. Is there any connection to what I'm finding and does it relate to what he is saying? And I found it to be exceedingly supportive and, and eye-opening to, uh, to look from both these angles, from just what human beings say when they get to a sixth-person perspective, and then to look at what, what Aurobindo says when he gets to the very earliest of his spiritual stages, which is higher mind. Then he goes to illumined mind, then intuitive mind, then uh, over mind, then super mind, and uh, so um, so I, uh, you know, because I'm just one person, I'm always so interested in hearing what other people think about this. And frankly, there's not a lot of people that really read our opinion that much, you know. So so I'm just grateful that I have a community of people here that that discuss it because you know when you read by yourself, you only get one small part of what you can understand. And so I love having the opportunity to sit in the community of people who are reading his, his great work. And, you know, there aren't very many people, there, there really aren't any, there's no other go-to that I have found that develops the, which works with the developmental side of the, of the, states and stages coin but Aurobindo he's the only go-to I know that goes late enough to really uh, have somebody that you can compare at these very late stages you know there's the state stages and then there's the structure stages and he has seems to have both and um, that's one of the reasons I respect him so much so thank you for letting me sit in on this and letting me come in late <laughs> just a just a note on state stages structure stages that distinction comes through will ken wilbur yeah correct yeah and, and he's proposing a um a particular model the, the aqua model this is for not everyone here has uh read wilbur uh or um is totally familiar with integral philosophy so just to clarify that, the structure stages are these, uh, let's say, developments in multiple lines that result in more or less stable patterns, right? That, or at least pattern possibilities uh, in cognition or affect or other um, modes, aspects of development. The state uh, stages, as Wilbur defines them, have to do not with a vertical uh, uh, development of more or less enduring, more or less stable structures, but the access to uh, progressively more subtle until, until, until very, very subtle or what he calls causal states of consciousness that can occur at any of the, in his, his theory, any mm -hmm. of the structures. Yeah. So uh, Aurobindo did not use that, as far as I'm aware, insofar as Wilbur claimed to have invented it, didn't use that distinction, but no. you see it there. No, he didn't use that distinction, but uh, he, he talked with the about the, you know, distinct developmental 
um, trajectory, uh, even in from the beginning of from the very beginning of his model, you know, matter before there was any life, matter than life, and then matter and life before there was any mind, and then matter, life, and mind. There's that trajectory. That and then there's, you know, his. Uh, 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 the body tra- trajectories, including the vital, and then he goes to the psychic, and then on up to um, you know these later developmental levels. But the he interpenetrates the the developmental stages with the with the spiritual aspect. And um, I'm not working with lines in mine either, uh, but he he has he works with the ego all the way through his frame what Aurobindo does and uh, I work with the ego development model so it it seems like it's congruent that way mm-hmm. and um, uh, so uh, the thing about Aurobindo is that it's kind of like an autobiography for him I mean he experienced these things and wrote them down and and um, so it's it's a uh, uh, you know a an experiential uh, description that he's that he's got, I think. And when we work with the developmental levels, we work with experience too. So uh, we don't have too many philosophers that I've found that that move into these very later stages like that. So, um, yeah, um, I wasn't really referring to Ken so much, although I've read his work and I've, I've worked a lot with his material. But uh, Ken really re- relies a lot on Aurobindo too, in my opinion. And he might add some flavors here and there. But from my perspective, you know that a lot of Ken's work is is based on Aurobindo as well, uh, because he is the go-to you know, from my perspective. So, yeah, I think he's. Mm-hmm somebody that many of us look towards for for the, the development or for a comparison because he is so well-spoken and so deep in so many areas. Take, for instance, active and passive. He has, you know, the active and passive, the active and static. He has all kinds of things that, that I find in, in the work that I do. You look for it, and there you find it in our Obindo, you know, and may not mean much to other people, but it means a lot to me and my work because there it is, and it's in my model, my work too, my research. So, so it gives me a hint that I might might be having something that is on the right track. So, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> There's a wonderful book by a Vedantic teacher from the 1950s named Judith Tyberg called Language of the Gods. Do you know Judith Tyberg, Terry? No. Uh, she, uh, the Language of the Gods is a, is a help for understanding Sanskrit in spiritual writings. And as you're talking about passive and active, it's like so obviously comes from the ancient texts all of this is uh is uh rich in sanskrit and that's it's a beautiful expansion on on, uh english like i think of the that cliche that how many words for snow does do the inuit have well sanskrit has i think i i think i tried counting about 12 words for soul including all the worlds, including all the different foldings of all these things. So there's a lot of richness that comes when integrating the world of Sanskrit with all these things that are going on today. Judith Tyberg is really special if you have
have a chance because she was teaching at a time when there weren't any there weren't females in academia and there she was this glowing light her spiritual name was Jyoti Priya and uh, wow she was amazing I think she came of age she was like she doing symposia on Sri Aurobindo in the 19 with Haridas Chaudhary in the 19 in the 1950s probably in the 40s and 50s. And Chaudhry was the one that started CIIS, you know. That's where I got my PhD. Was, and so we studied him while, while I was there. He, I think, believe he was sent by Aurobindo to start that school. So, yeah. And the active and passive, uh, that it, it's in many different kinds of texts, but they've traced it back to the earliest of language, and those are the first two kinds of, of uh, verbal uh, expressions people have are, are words for the static, which is like a rock because it sits still, and the active, like the wind or like the water because it moves. And it's just very fascinating how many and most of the of the uh, languages that they have found or that they have invented all come from the active and passive. And there are very few languages that actually none that they've found that don't have active and passive parts to it. So, but I will, I will look her up. She sounds, she sounds wonderful. What's her name again? Just so I can. Judith, Judith Tyberg. T-Y-B-E-R-G. Thank you so much. And one, a, a bit of encouragement. Also, I would say that this is a nonlinear text. And I keep hearing the second to the last chapter referred to and brought up, and that is the Gnostic being, in which he talks about Gnostic community and what the, what the evolved communities will look like. And, I, I I would say it's like it's not a linear progression to get to that second to the last chapter of the book, and it's okay to read the second to the last chapter if that's where your your attention is going. And I would say pick up any chapter out of context. Also, it's each chapter stands a stands alone is almost a complete work in and of itself. I mean, it does build over time, but anything can be can be looked at in that. In this, in in the life divine, you can't really pick it up in the middle of a chapter, though. Based on that thing that we were talking about before, when Eric was on, some of the arguments he does back. I don't need to repeat what was said, but it can be out of context if you just open up a do the insert the ruler in looking for wisdom and open it up. You can find the opposite thing that he's arguing and not really know if that's in context. But each chapter is is whole. Well, I just would like to note in response to um, Terry's point about this being autobiographical. Of course, it's not written as an autobiography, literally, of the person. Uh, but uh, there is a distinct point in the phenomenology of reading, right? There is a distinct sense one gets when uh, the author or feels that the author knows what they're talking about. And one feels held, not just in a description of something that the author may know about, but in a, uh, a kind of direct speaking of, from it, through it. Uh, we did a conversation a couple months ago uh, that was a, um, uh, a response to a reading of a paper by Jennifer Gidley on Evolving Planetary Consciousness and Integration of Integral Philosophies, I think was the title, something like that. But one of the things that she was trying to model or get to through that paper was this the difference between speaking about integral and speaking from integral. And how do you know exactly? <laughs> but there's some knowing when the author, as transmitted through the text, uh, 
and this is not to, of course, curtail the critical faculty of distinct, you know, parsing the argument. Uh, but I do feel that. And, and, and I felt it also with Gebser, with Gene Gebser, that as soon as you begin reading, you're in another, you, 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 you have a state experience, I think. It, it, the, the, the text itself ushers you into a state experience at least, if, insofar as you can parse the text and follow it, uh, of where the author was coming from in writing it. And I I've, uh, love that. Uh, I, I'm excited by that because the, the act of reading, the moment of reading, and then what stays with and then what comes through in these conversations that we're having, I, I feel it, um, it, uh, it amplifies that, that state. It, it sort of brings it into, it, it strengthens it in a way. It strengthens our, our access to it, perhaps, in one way of uh, putting it or thinking about it. So um, that bodes well, I think. Uh, I, I'm enjoying the reading and I'm finding it uh, very lucid. And I'm finding that I have to, in a sense, rise to it. I have to be more lucid in my own mentality and my own moment-to-moment -moment consciousness to, to, um, to, to not only understand, but to feel something of what he's saying. And we are reaching the top of the hour. Uh, and so I think I would like us to begin to transition out of this and think about the next talk. And um, I'll make just a couple of notes uh, and then I'll let Matteo, you also make any uh, remarks you'd like to and then anyone else who wants to. Uh, so logistically, this talk is recorded and uh, as soon as the recording is processed I'll be posting it to our forum on infiniteconversations.com it will go on the same topic uh, that was dedicated to this particular event so if there's something that arises something that you meant to say or question or whatever may uh, arise uh, for you you can share it there and the conversation can continue and others who weren't able to be present with us here could also watch the video and participate uh, asynchronously. And, and then out of that, you know, next, I will also post an event for next week, and then the recording will go on that topic. So uh, you're, I welcome, invite you and welcome you to, uh, to participate there if, if you uh, feel, um, if, if you'd like to do so. And um, I would like to see who might like to lead us next time uh, and uh, uh, pick up in the same format where we start with the meditation and, and then, uh, like, as you did wonderfully, I think, Matteo, thank you so much, uh, lead our conversation next time. Would, would anybody here like to uh, step up to that? I suppose I'm typically the one that would step up, but I just wanted to let you know that this month in particular will be difficult for me. Um, I don't want to make any promises, um, but if the time comes around, nobody here volunteers, then I will, and I might show up with nothing. <laughs> I could also post the question on the forum, and uh, whoever wants to reply there can. Maybe somebody who left the call earlier would, uh, would uh, like to do that. Uh, so, hmm, how can we, I'm going to count to five. <laughs> no, no one um, uh, raises their hand, then uh, it will be either somebody who's not here right now or Doug. And if, if it's none of those, then I will do it. One, two, three, four. Four and a half. Your hand is up. <laughs> oh, shoot. There's a, okay. Uh, Marco, I'm also happy to do it whenever and on the fly, too. It can be last minute, too. I don't, I'm not going to just take over. I appreciate 
everyone's input in a full body discussion. And if I'm here, I'll always participate, but I'm also happy to facilitate any time. Well, I like your rhythm, the way you presented it, Matteo, it was really nice. Because I'm such a, I live in Manhattan, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a borderline <laughs> you know, most of the time. So, but, so it's really relaxing for me to let someone else, um, you know, develop a, a communal space like this. So, um, so I, that's why I'm reluctant to volunteer because I feel like, you know, this isn't quite the right text for me to be introducing. Um, as much as I love it, I just feel it's a little bit, uh, I'm out of my depth here. So, and I'm fine with that, but that's why I'm reluctant to volunteer. If it was Schlotterdijk, I'd have no problem volunteering with, it, with Schlotterdijk. <clears throat> but I, I would, uh, or, or other authors we've studied, but this was so, sort of different. So I just want to let you know, it's not mm -hmm. because I'm indifferent. It's just because I, I just don't feel up to, the, up to the challenge right now. I think I should ask Eric to lead us next time. He um, has, you know, I, I don't feel up to it either, actually. I mean, I would do it for the sake of the group. Uh, right. But um, I, I uh, am a total beginner here uh, with this text anyway, and I could kind of intellectually riff on it. and Maybe I can write a poem or something, but I don't think it would really capture the depth of what we're reading. And so... Um, but that may be fine, too. Uh, I mean, one of the in things here is that this is not exactly an academic context. It's not, it's, it's sort of an, a context that is meant to be, uh, it's meant for a mix of beginners. Uh, nobody, I think, is an expert, but more, let's say, uh, familiar uh, or readers uh, and, and also who maybe see something that all the academics have missed, right? Or that. So um, I'll ask Eric if he uh, declines, then, then uh, Doug, let's talk and maybe we can work on something. Maybe we can do it together. Uh, and, um, and it will be the same time, uh, 6 p.m. Mountain Time next Thursday. Same Zoom link. Uh, and again, I think it worked out with the waiting room because I can see when somebody shows up. So if you're late, uh, just wait in the waiting room. And uh, at the top of the hour, if, if not sooner, we'll let you in. And um, uh, I have no, I think, other logistical uh, remarks. So, Matteo, anything else you would like to add or no, any way you would like to just to step in, I, I would have volunteered, but I can't be there next week uh, because I have another previous commitment. But I will do it the week after if okay. it's been open at that time. Okay. We'll pencil you in. <laughs> and, and maybe after, after that, I'll have a, a little bit more a feeling for this so I could volunteer. But I'm, I'm just not ready to volunteer yet. But I'm looking forward to that when it does happen. Thank you. You know, one more thing I'll add too is that uh, I, I began doing these group calls partly to get over my shyness and nervousness around group calls and situations. Doug has said the same thing or similar thing. We talked about it. So um, it is public in a, in, in a certain way, but uh, uh, you know, one, it also from a certain other perspective, maybe Aurobindo's perspective, whatever you say, however it comes out is perfect in it. And so uh, if we, I, I think we can uh, allow, or maybe we can consciously create a space for that. And um, I'm sure it'll take some time to develop, but we have uh, a few months to work on this. So um, if we're in, let's, let's, let's go all the way, I say. <laughs> Superminder <laughs> plus. So I also had a quick question with maybe not so quick an answer, but um, but for maybe Matteo. So um, I'm kind of curious what the relationship between Aurobindo's text and, for instance, he talks about the Buddha quite a lot. And the Brahman is a, at least partially a Hindu concept. Uh, and and so I'm wondering what the relationship between Aurobindo's writings and some of the other religions are. 
And I, I know it's a big question, but I thought maybe somebody or Matteo might, you might have some reference text that you could refer that I could read a bit about it. So I'm just throwing that out. So much, Jeffrey. I, I don't know. Mo the mother, Mira Alfasa, has these, this lovely, amazing book in 1958 called Commentaries on the Dhammapada that uh, has shows that she was a fully realized Buddhist at the time of arrival in India. Uh, there's, there's so many because the synthesis of yoga, he's synthesizing Raja Yoga with Hatha Yoga. He's, he's just synthesizing all the different uh, forms of yoga together into Purna, complete yoga that came to be known as integral yoga, comes from the Sanskrit Purna. Uh, there's just, yeah, we can talk about that offline. It's it's a vast question, Jeffrey. Uh, I, I want to say I've met people that kind of can position themselves as experts on Sri Aurobindo, and that's, that's like completely laughable. Like everyone is interfacing this from their own field of expertise, actually. Every soul, well, a beautiful thing about integral yoga is Swabhava and Swadharma, one's own essential self of being and one's own particular unique formation of Dharma for being here. No, uh, I think anyone, uh, any sort of Sri Aurobindo exegete is really just, uh, there, there's, it's, I don't know, it's, a, it's scholarship around Sri Aurobindo. Teaching Sri Aurobindo is a bit of a misnomer. So, and because of Swabhava and Swadharma, how can I tell you what your work is in this world and how to interface with this text and what your soul is? Uh, what your soul's path is it's it's unique for all of us so it's uh, i i would i think anyone here is perfectly uh, facilitating this is just uh i think opening it up and kind of holding the holding the container there's um i don't i do i'm certainly not qualified to 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 facilitate this in any, in any sort of academic way. And I appreciate Eric's style and Eric's a scholar and approaches it from a scholastic perspective. And I appreciate that also. That's not, that's his approach. And, um, but it's not like that approach is of any higher order than someone that's just looking uh, to approach it from a pure experiential point. And sometimes there's friction between those two and maybe that friction is a good thing. Can I respond to, to that, Matteo? Because I'm reading uh, Aurobindo, the, the Future Poetry. Oh, and, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and I think many of us are, are writers and are, are write poetry or love poetry. And um, I think as I've re I read this, about half of it, the Aurobindo on Shakespeare and Keats and Shelley, you know, it's a it's territory that I'm very familiar with. So when I hear him talking about these uh, these poets, he it's very easy for me to enter into his his world um, because that we share this world. He was a Westerner in some ways. He was raised in Britain and he spoke English before he spoke uh, uh, other languages. So I find this a real compatible entry, and I think that's a a way that I, I think I like to read this is just like poetry and just let go of all the, 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 the foreign words and trying to penetrate, um, you know, those uh, kind of Sanskrit terms and as fascinating as that is, and there's plenty of material. I mean, I'm looking at this guy, Banerjee, and I think we've shared some of his videos online. Um, Banerjee, he's, his uh, quartet, uh, seven quartets of becoming. He's written this about um, the record of yoga, um, which is a, a record of uh, it's a, a diary that Aurobindo kept of his paranormal experiences and his his paranormal experiments, um, telepathy and remote viewing and all kinds of things that he was uh, he was cultivating. So I think those are those are the kind of things that really help me get into it rather than trying to come at it from a, a, a level of scholarship, which I don't have. <clears throat> so I would, I just wanted to respond to what you were saying that you're sort of giving all of us a permission to find whatever we're good at. We can bring this to this reading 
and whatever we feel deficient in, just let it go <laughs> because it doesn't matter that much. Because someone here, the value of such a group is this, is that, you know, whatever you might be missing, someone else is going to pick up on. And um, so I think that's the pleasure of a group reading like this. Thank you. I don't want to push us I, over. I, oh, <laughs> go ahead. I was going to, after Heather, could we have a group meditation and then yeah. maybe. I'll make my comment very quick. So this is just in response to Jeffrey's question about um, traditions. So Matteo mentioned the mother's Buddhism, but she was actually also a Jewish mystic. And I have a dissertation that explores that in depth. So that Gnostic chapter, and when Eric said, I think it was Eric who said he feels the, the dual, uh, you know, directionality of that inquiry. I'm wondering how much that is the mother with Sri Aurobindo, um, those two sides of that mm. expressing themselves. Okay. Is that I could probably say a lot. The, the, all this stuff came about when the mother came to India. All of this is a fusion of their consciousness. The record of yoga that Debashish writes about in the Seven Courts of Quartets of Becoming, actually all that stuff predates and came out, predates the mother's landing in, in, uh, in India and Pondicherry. So I would, I would say all of this writing is a fusion of the mother's consciousness. They fused their consciousness. And I don't want to keep going. I could kind of go on about that for a long time, but we'll, we have plenty of time to, to chat. Um, two minute meditation. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Lovely. Au revoir. Yeah. Nice to meet everyone. It's new. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.